Welcome to Treasure Lake Church. I think that we probably do want to join in that new song and praise the name of the Lord for He is good. He walks with us. He cares for us. He is transforming us and He gives us every blessing that we have in this life. We praise and we recognize Him. Thanks that we can do so together. As we're going to take some time and pray and ask the Lord to send his blessings, to lift up the name of Jesus. I wanted to mention a few things. Some are really worthy of praise. We're very thankful for a week that uh, had a huge challenge for Rick Maybe on Labor Day. He had a very serious heart attack, but the goodness and the grace of God had that moment come exactly when he was in the emergency room with everybody that he needed right there. He's doing incredibly well. Some nurses have said that he's one in a million. We're thankful for God's grace and how he is doing well right now. We're thankful that uh, we have a start with our youth group and with Get Fed, and we had all sorts of people connecting with each other, and that's good for the soul, and we end up spurring each other on to loving good deeds. It's a beautiful thing to see. We want to pray for many people. We want to ask that the Lord would encourage and strengthen Marlon. He's uh, been moved to a nursing home now. We're praying that he would have strength and that he would recover. We're very glad to see Jim Rittenhouse with us. He hasn't been able to get out very often, but he came out on Wednesday in order to be with his church family. Thrilled to see it. Continue to pray for Doug Odgers, for Wendy, as she has her medication adjustment. We're praying for Olivia Bigelow, that uh, God Almighty would give some answers to some questions that were raised and that she would be healthy and strong. We're praying for Bill Wrights, who has surgery coming up on the 10th. That's real soon now, that it would be very successful. We're asking that God would strengthen Janet Litz and Jim Craw, Lana London, people that are precious and dear. Let's take some time and pray for our many of these people that we love so much. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that your goodness and your kindness, it is wonderful. And so we want to join in singing that song that gives you glory and praise. Thank you for the blessings that come today. They will come tomorrow. Your goodness is with us at all times. May you be praised, Jesus, we have a Savior. We trust you and you alone and you are worthy of all of all of the faith that we have. Increase our faith. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you lead us and you instruct us and you show us what a good life is. May you be praised and glorified. We're thankful to Heavenly Father for the way that your kingdom is moving forward. We ask that it would move forward through every single church here in the Dubois area. Father, we want to love you with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. May that be one of the strengths of our lives. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we could pray for Marlon. We ask that you would increase his strength and that you would bring vigor to him. We pray for Doug as he continues to recover from surgery and the doc still has some questions about other things that might be necessary. Father, we pray that you would heal him in the name of Jesus. We ask that Wendy's medication, that it would be um, administered and it would be monitored in such a way that she would find that she has a new lease on life that's bigger. Lord, we want to pray that you would heal Olivia, that Sue Streeter would uh, be able to move through the procedures upcoming, keep her healthy as she's preparing for them. We ask, Father, that you take away the cancer that affects Beth and Eleanor, Denise and Alex's mom, Todd, Aunt Betty, Missy and Mike, Dale, Kath, and Steph. Now, Heavenly Father, we know that you love each and every one of us. We pray for successful surgeries as they are coming up. We pray for people to be able to walk in your grace and to love each other. We ask that you strengthen our families and teach us how to uh, love those who are around us. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. You are worthy of all praise. May you be praised on this day by us, your grateful kids. In the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen.
Hey church family, the petting zoo is coming to us. The kettle corn will be popping right here. The obstacle courses in the gym will be better than ever and the pig roast is great as always. So if hay rides, pumpkin painting, and apple cider sound like they're made to order in September, we are going to be the place. It's time for fall festival. We see this as one big gift that we get to extend to our community. Everything is free. Everything is done in the name of Jesus. God's people are throwing a big party, making a world of fun for the families of our community. We just can't wait. The volunteer sign-up sheet is at the welcome desk. We need everyone's help on Sunday, September 22nd. Let us know that you are available and we'll share with you the multiple places where you can jump in. Please note, right beside the volunteer sign-up sheet is a sign-up for bringing cookies. We need so many cookies. If you can provide a dozen or dozens, it would be a great help. It was wonderful to have our full Wednesday evening lineup back this week. We started with Get Fed at 5.30, our Bible studies began at 6, and it's happening this week again. No need to sign up, just come and be a part of God's blessing. Remember that our youth group meets on two different days. We get that sports schedules are in high gear. So if you're busy Wednesday evening, 6 to 8 p.m., then come after school on Tuesdays from 3.15 to 5 p.m. Come both times if you like. Have you been thinking about becoming a member here at TLC? 
Would you like more information? Our membership discussions start back up this week. Join us for two discussions on the second and third Sundays of the month. We meet between our two Sunday services at 10 a.m. in the library. For September, that means the 8th and the 15th. Men's breakfast takes place on Saturday morning, September 21st at 8.30 a.m. We have lots of great food and even better conversation. We meet in the fellowship hall. While this summer is wrapping up, it's time to look toward the next summer. <laughs> the Christian Appalachian Project shows the love of God to many in the part of the country that isn't so far from here. Last year's floods turned Brenda's world upside down, leaving the home she's lived in more than 20 years in shambles. We didn't have no electric for six weeks and we didn't have no water for over two months. TLC would like to partner with the Christian Appalachian Project next summer. We can be part of their team that works during a five-day project that takes place on June 2nd to the 6th or June 9th to the 13th. Would you be interested in being part of this outreach? You would need to be at least 14 years old to participate. Today at the welcome desk, there is a sign-up sheet where you can sign up to learn more about this opportunity. If you leave your name and number, we will reach out to you with more details. If this is your first time with us, thanks for being here. We welcome you. Please find the welcome card in the pew in front of you, fill it out and leave it in the basket on your way out of the sanctuary. There is a classic scene that we find in many of our movies. It goes like this. There is a group of people who are running after a train. The wheels are moving fast. The opportunity to get on board is brief, and therefore for a moment or two, all focus must be placed on matching one speed to the train that's cruising at a pretty good clip. If you don't focus, you're going to be in peril of missing the train. And in the plot of each of these stories, there is a lot to lose if you miss that train. Therefore, focus, increase your speed, and catch that train. We start our reading today with this tension. You see, there is a train of thought that is moving down the tracks. It's actually moving down the tracks at a pretty good clip. The driver of the train may not be exactly aware of just how fast that train is moving, but for those of us who have our feet on the ground, it's going to take some concerted focus in order to jump on to the train. The Apostle Paul is the driver of this train. He has something that he wants to say. It's pretty important to him. And why is this train of thought moving at such a fast clip? It has everything to do with where we ended up our reading in the text last week. Paul had just introduced the idea and the thought of reconciliation, that our great God, despite the fact that we were enemies to him, he decided to make us friends and actually to adopt us. And in doing so, our great God has colored outside of the lines and showed us amazing love. Well, with reconciliation being the topic, there are a few questions that come to mind, and the questions could involve thoughts like this. Now, why was this reconciliation needed, and just how long has this reconciliation needed, been needed? So Paul, who's driving this train of thought, he may not be aware that he's leaning on the throttle as he begins to answer these questions. He's so focused on his topic, he may not perceive just how fast he's pushing this train of thought down the rails. But everybody who isn't squarely on board is going to feel that they could be left behind. And so let's look at one of these questions that Paul wants to address now about reconciliation how long has reconciliation been needed? Well, there are some times in which in order to get a good solid answer to a question, you need to spend a good amount of time looking back at history and how we got here. So I'm pretty sure that we're all aware today that there is quite a conflict that exists between the Palestinian people and the Israelites 
And so the Jewish state views things very different. And if we want to understand how we got into this situation, well, you probably need some time because you're going to have to listen to some stories that are very much encased in history. And each people group has a hardened historical perspective on the matter. If you want to understand, you're going to have to give it some time and you might be amazed at what comes up from the historical perspective. If you want to ask the question and get an answer as to why there is a Hungarian-speaking community that's living deep within the borders of Romania in a mountainous section called Hargita, you're going to have to listen to the history and note the details, for there is a huge amount of information that can explain the answer and lead you to the truth. It's going to take a little bit of time. And so if we want to ask the question, why is it that man needs to be reconciled with God? Paul's thinking, wow, there is a huge historical answer to that question, and we're really going to have to talk about it. Paul's going to leap over just centuries of time, and he's going to drive all the way back to the beginning on how everything started. And because Paul is so familiar with this material, it might feel like the train is just lurching forward as Paul begins to speak. But he knows that he must speak of how things began with a historical perspective. Just how long has reconciliation been needed? We find ourselves in chapter 5 of the book of Romans, and we will be working through the verses 12, from 12 to 21. And Paul is going to answer this question, how long has reconciliation been needed? In verses 12, 17, and 19, here's what Paul has to say. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, that is the other one, the many will be made righteous. Well, this is the data that is going to answer the question, how did we get here? When did this all start? Why do we need reconciliation? And why is it that absolutely everyone finds themselves with the same problem? History is going to answer that question. And so looking at verse 12, it says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all people because all sin. Paul pinpoints a specific moment in time. And I think that you've noticed he refers to the big culprit four times in these three verses. There is one person responsible. There is one origin for the virus that produced this pandemic. It is one man, his name happens to be Adam, and he is the avenue through which sin enters the world. And having entered the world, it will travel to absolutely everyone, and it will bring death. In fact, death will set up its kingdom because of what Adam has done, and Therefore, we say Adam was the one who started this all off and we are all affected or perhaps it might be just as well said, we have all become infected. Now, what's true is that Paul finds the Bible to be incredibly helpful in answering significant questions. When he looks back at Genesis and the first three chapters, he realized, wow, right in those first three three chapters, you can find answers like this. Um, Where did everything come from? Where did we come from? And why in the world is there tension between us and God? Why is there need of reconciliation? Paul says the answer would be found in the very first chapters of Genesis. And in that answer, there's a picture that is going to be emerging. And Paul paints the picture this way. He says, you need to understand that there was something that wanted to come into this world and it was looking through an avenue, a venue whereby it could enter. And it found one when it came through a particular person. His name was Adam. Notice that it came through this person. And what is it that came through this person and entered into the world? It is sin that came through Adam. And having entered into our world, Paul explains, it is going to spread to absolutely everyone like a pandemic. 
And the result is going to be a state of brokenness in which life is broken in so many ways. There is no peace with God. Reconciliation is necessary. We find ourselves at each other's throats because through one man, sin entered into the world. So you want to know how it started? Um, This is how. Adam disobeyed God and he triggered a massive change. And all of this happened through one man. The story of Genesis captures the story very well. You see, the commands were not many, but God had said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was a very clear command, and the tree was known, and, well, Adam disobeyed, which ruptured and broke his relationship with God Almighty. It changed the world forever. Now, God's command was simple. It was clear, do not do it. And one man and his wife, they broke that command and they unleashed, they let into this world something that had not been here previous. And Paul says, I want you to know, everything went south with Adam and the choice that Adam made. Here's how he simply puts it in verse 17. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, Well, he looks back and he says, I can show you the pivotal moment. And as far as Paul's concerned, here's what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, oh, you know that thing with Adam? That happened so long ago. You you can sort of stop worrying about it. Don't be concerned about that story that was just affecting a single person. We're doing fine. He says, actually, what Adam did, it unleashed the whirlwind that tears at us. It is what started the rebellion. It is the moment of our downfall. History swings on that particular choice that Adam made in the garden. And because of that, death entered and death reigns. And death is a very ugly ruler. It shows up as a tyrant. And it likes to push people around with all of its weight. And I suppose that what we see and experience from that moment is this, is that because of the decision that Adam made, well, there is a chain reaction of events that happens. Um, It would be a mistake to describe what Adam did as something that was just little, for the impact grew and it grew. It extended wherever man went. It latched itself onto our society. It messed with each person's heart. It is the cause of the worst pandemic that has ever been experienced by man. We are part of that chain reaction and the dominoes keep falling. The initial push that was created by Adam originated in him. It affects us all and we are not just victims of it, but we are contributors to it. The world changed through that trespass. Now, I know that moment in the garden so long ago, it uh, might appear to be just sort of an individual decision, like we all make individual decisions. On the one hand, it was a a decision that Adam and Eve, they they made. But on the other hand, something erupted from that. A, A new thing entered into this world and brought with us a state of corruption. It showed up and it was nasty, it was crude, it was selfish, and it was hungry. You see, what entered the world and the whole scenario was was worse than that of the story of Pandora's box. You see, in the story of Pandora's box, there's something in a box that, that wants to get out. In the story of Adam, there was something that wanted to get in, and when it came in, it, it came and it destroyed, and it brought with it all of its luggage that we hate for when sin shows up. It hauls with it disease and frustration, calamity and distortion, deception, greed, pride, and death, all of that showed up with Adam. Now what Paul wants to do is, he wants in these verses to explain two things to us. He wants to say, hey, I want to tell you about the cause, how we got here, and how long we've been suffering with this need of reconciliation. I want to tell you about the solution as well, and and Paul's going to be going back and forth between the cause and the solution. And And because he's so engaged in all of this, he's actually going to bounce back and forth between the cause and solution seven times in nine verses. That's what creates the 
feeling of speed and, and what's so rapid in these verses. It's the back and forth and the back and forth. He, he wants to say, man, this guy unleashed it and this guy solved it. This man did this and this person resolved it. This man, and he goes back and forth and back and forth. And what you're noticing is that I've uh, chosen rather than jump back and forth that many times to approach our text kind of looking at each theme the theme of who is this one man who unleashed it and soon we're going to come to and who is this one man who shows up who fixes it but before we get there there's two verses that I don't want us to miss and they're in verses 13 and 14 they say this to be sure sin was in the world before the law was given But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did, who is a pattern of the one to come. Now, every Jew understood this, is that the law of God came through Moses, and before Moses, well, you just didn't have all of the instructions that you find in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy that laid out very clearly what is right and what is wrong. And Paul wants to say, despite the fact that you didn't have the law, I tell you, sin's effect was here for death reigned from the time of Adam all the way to Moses, even without the law, and notice that the text names Adam. Adam is the culprit which has caused all of this. And because of Adam, death is going to reign. He let it in. And this person, Adam, is going to affect everything that happened. But before Paul finishes these two verses, he uses a term that's actually going to link him to where he wants to go. He says, now this Adam, this Adam is a pattern of the one to come. Notice that Paul didn't say that Adam is a pattern of the next 25 billion people to live on the planet. He didn't say that Adam is a pattern of the nations that would arise. He said very precisely that Adam is the pattern of the one to come. And so what we have in Paul's mind is this. You see, there is the one man who unleashed the monster and I want you to know that he's a pattern of the other man who will show up and he will slay the monster. Adam is the one who caused the problem of reconciliation to be needed. And the other man is going to come and he's going to bring the solution of reconciliation. You see, the problem of sin came through one man, but the gift that solves the problem is going to come through another. And what Paul wants to do is he wants to make a contrast between these two. So let's take a look at the contrast by reading from verses 15 and 16. But the gift, it is not like the the trespass. Much, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? But the gift followed many trespasses, and it brought justification. Now, what Paul's doing in this text is he's being incredibly clever, and he's setting up a contrast. I think that we can see the contrast rather clearly. You see, if this is what happened under Adam, there's something else that happened later. You see, there was uh, something else that was interested in coming into the world. And that thing which wanted to come into the world, it chose to come through someone. It came through the other man. Notice it didn't just come when he came, it actually came through him. And what comes through this person who's named as Jesus is a gift that God would send to us all. He sent a gift that would actually become available to absolutely everyone. And through this gift that's available to everyone, that which was broken can be restored. This is what is happening through the person by the name of Jesus. In other words, the problem came through one man and the solution, it comes through another. The problem came to everyone and the solution is going to be available to everyone. The problem brought death and the solution brings life. You see this extraordinary parallel that exists between the two. It's so extraordinary that Paul will later refer to Jesus as the second Adam for he came in the pattern of the first Adam and this diagram sets up the 
parallelism that is just extraordinary. And what he's saying through this parallelism is this. Oh, the topic of reconciliation, I want you to know, it showed up, but it came as a gift. In other words, the gift came, and it is not like the trespass. The trespass was a disaster, and the gift was miraculous. But the gift followed many trespasses, and it brought justification. The first person, he brought a burden, and he stole our joy, and many died from his work. The second one brought a gift that gives life. The first person, he brought judgment and condemnation. The second person, he brought justification. The gift is not like the trespass. Don't you see the contrast? You see, they are two very different men who are making two very different contributions I think that we feel it, how vastly different these two lives are. And when Paul is talking about these two people, to be honest, there's so many things that he wants to say about these two people that he just goes back and forth between each one, making comparisons, creating the sensation of speed in all of these verses. But making sure that we do not go too fast, let's linger a little bit on verse 17, which says this. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus? I think in these words, there's something that we might feel I think in these words, we might feel that Paul is saying, hey, there's going to be no yin and yang in this topic. Now, the concept of yin-yang comes with this idea that some believe, well, there's an equal amount of good and evil in the world. They are of the same size. They are of the same potency. And perhaps someone would say, well, here you go, Paul. You just introduced a negative figure. His name's Adam. He introduces sin, you introduce a positive figure, Jesus, he brings reconciliation, and someone might say, looks to me like you're talking about a system of good and bad, a yin and a yang that are somewhat equal, to which Paul would say, oh, I know of no system in which good and evil are of the same proportion. No, not at all. You see, Jesus is greater, greater than the problem. Look at the words. Paul says, how much more than will those who receive God's, and look what they receive. They don't receive just something small. They receive something that's abundant. And they aren't just returned from life, from death into life, but they will actually reign in this life. Do you see that God is going to show up with so much more? You see, God didn't send someone who was simply equal to the challenge. God sent someone who brought overwhelming force, who would clearly bring us overwhelming victory. That's who God sent into this desperate equation in which you and I were living. God sent someone who is so much greater than all of our problems. Verse 18, consequently... Just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Yeah, it's true. Through that one person, Adam, all people are affected, devastated. The pandemic struck. Everyone is affected. It is an awful situation. And then Jesus shows up and he offers to all of those people the freedom to leave, be well, and have reconciliation with God Almighty. In verse 20, Paul says this, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in life, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Note Paul's emphasis again. Jesus shows up and grace increases all the more. Grace is abundant. It increases all the more because Jesus is greater than all of our problems. 
You see, God's grace is greater than all of our sin. It's true that Adam sinned, and Eve sinned, and the generation sinned, and I've sinned. It's a grim picture of what's going on, but God Almighty, He sends Jesus, who is greater than all of our sins. Grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all of our sin. It's absolutely stunning. God sent overwhelming force to make sure that you and I could be restored and reconciled to him. It came through the one man, Jesus, resolving the infinite number of problems that we created here. And because he came and did this for him, we adore him. I'd like to share a story that is written by a dad by the name of Timothy Jones. And the story goes this way. I never dreamed taking a child to Disney World could be so difficult. Our middle daughter was adopted and had been previously in a foster system. For one reason or another, where whenever our daughter's previous families vacationed at Disney World, they took their biological children, but they left the girl who would become our daughter with someone else. So by the time that we adopted her, she had seen pictures of Disney World, had heard about the rides, the characters, and the parades, but she had never set foot inside the gates of the Magic Kingdom. And once I found out, I, I made plans to take her to Disney World. I didn't expect what happened next. The prospect of visiting the dream world produced a stream of downright devilish behavior in her. In the month leading up to our trip to the Magic Kingdom, she stole food, she lied, she whispered insults carefully crafted to hurt her older sister. And as the days moved closer to the trip, her mutinies multiplied. I think I figured it out. She had been left out of those trips for no good reason, which was incredibly painful. Well, this time she was going to give just cause for the exclusion she believed was coming. A couple of days before we left, she said, I know what you're going to do. You're not going to take me to Disney World. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but in that moment, I was tempted to turn her fear to my advantage the easiest response would have been to say, well, if you don't start behaving better, you're right, you won't be going. But by God's grace, I didn't. Instead, I asked her, um, is this trip something we're doing as a family? She nodded. Are you part of this family? She nodded again. Then you're going with us, you're part of the family, and we're not leaving you behind. I'd like to say that her behavior improved. It didn't. When we got to Disney, it was a typical day. Overpriced tickets, overpriced meals, lots of lines mingled with just enough mag manufactured magic to consider going again. In our hotel room that evening, a very different child emerged. She was exhausted and a little weepy at times, but her month-long rebellion had faded. When bedtime rolled around, I prayed with her, held her, and asked, So, how was your first day at Disney World? Daddy, she said, I finally got to go to Disney World. But it wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. It wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. And that is the message of God's awesome grace. It comes to us not because we deserved it. It comes to us not because we're exceptional. It comes to us not because we fulfilled the law or done everything that God wants. It comes to us because he says, you are mine and I will gift you with it. Believe in me. Trust in me. Believe in me. And trust in me, as Paul says in this text. But the gift is not like the trespass. God's gift and grace, they came through the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, and they have overflowed 
to many. Grace, oh grace. God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace. God's grace. Grace that is greater than all of my sin. Father, we thank you for your grace. And we thank you that you showed up with overwhelming force. You are greater than our problems. And we thank you that you wipe away our sins. You transform our lives. You love us thoroughly. God, we understand we are connected with Adam and we find ourselves to be a sinful people. And we thank you that by your goodness and your love, you sent the one and the only Jesus Christ to be our Savior. And so we trust him with our everything, realizing that there is no other Savior who could help us. We give you great praise for him and for the grace which flows to us. May you, our Father, be praised now and forevermore. You are glorious, our Lord. Amen.